Well, hello and welcome to the penultimate episode of Backseat Designer Season V. We don't do episode numbers, but this one should be pretty safe. As always, I am, of course, Frederick Olsen, and I am joined by my two esteemed and lovely co-hosts. First of all, the Space Quest historian, Charles Plymouth. Hello. And Professor Dr. Knight of the British Empire, Dr. Gareth <laughs> Millwood. <laughs> two doctors. Two titles yes. I don't have. Excellent work. <laughs> Hello. Two doctors in one. Well, we're playing it very, very loose with the titles. I mean, this is this is not, you know, this is the time for doing this. You're nearly, you know, getting out of the union and everything. So this is the time to have your kicks. <laughs> And alongside our lovely co-hosts, uh, we have a guest in our midst. Jess Haskins is here. How are you doing, Jess? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jess gave a talk at AdventureX last year, which um, all of us agree was the best talk of the conference. Oh, shucks, guys. <laughs> I mean, Brian Moriarty was up there, but yeah, I still think he got him. Brian Moriarty has some technical difficulties with uh, his iPad, and you didn't. You know, the guy is so unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Just waltz in, well, wave an iPad around, and say some stuff. Come on. Yeah. Well, I guess we're never getting him, him on the show, are we? <laughs> I don't think we were to begin with. Oh, but, uh, on, on, that, on that note, uh, so glad to see the professor back in our midst, having disappeared from the previous episode. I... I hope your gonorrhea has cleared up, sir. <laughs> so I didn't the, have anything to do with it, I swear. What do you think's further from the truth, the gonorrhea or the fact that I'm a professor? Which of those lies is the bigger one? Have you ever had gonorrhea? <laughs> and we can bleep your answer, that's fine. <laughs> Not diagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a good well, at answers, me. While the subject of your existential crisis deeply fascinates me, <laughs> what we would like to talk to you about today, Jess, is the subject of representation and diversity in gaming, which was also uh, the subject of your talk at AdventureX. How did you get started um, working with this subject? Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of funny. I, I, the talk ended up being about that, but I made sure like not to put any of those words in the title. It was a talk on the politics of world building, um, which just kind of uh, turned into a talk about, you know, when you think about politics, you think about like the representation in your games and the stories that you're telling and the way you're portraying the world. Um, because world building is uh, really my main bag. Um, and the talk kind of came out of um, some like classes that I've taught, just like a, you know, one night like seminar course on better world building games and like guest critiquing like student uh, student projects uh, in like narrative and world building and just seeing some of the same stuff that you also see in hobbyist games or in big commercial games or like everywhere. And just basically having these things that I wanted to shout at people about how to like build better worlds and and stop doing dumb stuff. So I decided <laughs> to start getting on stage and and gently shouting at people about it. That try is to a define, noble try, cause. Try to, try to define dumb stuff a bit. You know, play it play it completely safe with us. Pretend we're idiots, which is frankly not that far from the truth. Yeah, I was going to say pretend. <laughs> yeah, Charles Cecil mentioned a lovely, lovely game on uh, the last episode we did, which was called Custis Revenge, and we cannot wait for it oh, yeah. to be uh, forgotten completely. So do explain it's some... It's not going to happen when we keep bringing it up, up, is it? <laughs> well, no one listens to this Hey, remember that anyway. thing you wanted to forget totally about? Yeah, that. <laughs> no, I, I, can't, I can't remember what I actually mentioned, but I can remember that I wanted you to explain what dumb stuff is in this context. Right. I mean, a lot of people, can, we can all pretty much look at Custer's Revenge, which, you know, is this uh, old NES game that, yes, it was actually made where, you know, you you uh, get to play General Custer getting his revenge and your prize at the end is this, you know, native woman tied to a stake awaiting you to have your way with her. 
Um, we can all kind of obviously look at that and go like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's um, not done well. <laughs> but, you know, you, you don't see many people doing that sort of thing anymore unless they're trying to, you know, shock and provoke. Um, but what you do see is just sort of like unexamined assumptions and, you know, people repeating um, the patterns and the stories and the worlds that they know from the movies and games and comic books and just all the media that they kind of grew up with and are steeped in that, you know, often, uh, you know, especially the older you go back in time, like the more unexamined uh, kind of questionable ideas about representation of women and minorities and people with disabilities and people from different right. cultures and, um, you know, just all of, all of the, you know, before people were woke and before we started having these conversations that are a bit more, you know, common in the mainstream. But even, you know, even if you're like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a sensitive person, like, you know, I'm not a racist, I, you know, I'm a feminist, like, I'm, I'm all, you know, I, I support all this stuff that, you know, we don't call PC anymore. Um, but if you don't like... And then there's inevitably buts. Uh. Right. I mean, if, if you don't, you know, if you're like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally like a, you know, consciousness raised aware person. That's totally cool. But then if when you sit down to make work, you just sort of regurgitate all of the media and stuff that you've consumed in the past that have these things baked in without even thinking about them, like, you know, Tomb Raider, you know, oh, oh it's, you know, totally cool to just, you know, go to exotic foreign climes and run around and, you know, rage their tombs and rob them of all their cultural artifacts for, you know, adventure. As an English person, like, I see absolutely nothing wrong in that whatsoever. <laughs> How dare you not have a national sport? Of course. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I, I recently you know, visited your, your lovely country um, and your fine institutions, and I realized I was carrying my British Museum tote bag around. Like, hmm, yep. well, I am kind of advertising the rapacious colonizer you know, uh, institution here. Maybe I should carry a different kind of tote bag. Beautiful collections, like you nicked some great stuff from the rest of the we, world. We really but... did. The British Museum is the world's biggest crime scene. But one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that I really like about um, about uh, the, the world that you're describing there, though, isn't necessarily the sort of the. I mean, the moral argument is important. Let's be very clear about that. But I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with Constantinos earlier on in the series: is that without diversity and without paying attention to those sorts of things, it's like not building a city in a logical way you you very quickly i think lose the sense of immersion in the story that you're telling yeah i think so like that's that's sort of my um kind of where i started with world building is you know i'm i'm the person that like you know watches star trek and like thinks about like the the cultures and the politics and like the history of like all the aliens that they meet and i want it to like fit together it's like well last week we talked about these people and like they still exist in the universe right and like what sort of influence would they have on the geopolitical system we have going on here and like <laughs> but you can't just like pretend that they don't exist anymore because you just want to tell a story about this thing now like i want the pieces to kind of all fit together and make a cohesive world and there's of course lots of um you know it's in the in in sci-fi and like you know novels or like filmmaking or like games like any kind of just the theory of world building there's always this you know there's this camp that kind of like poo poos the nerds that want like basically all the wiki <laughs> like lore backstore backstory information and are pointing and said oh but you said the war happened like a hundred years ago so how mm. could your father have been in it because he would have just been a kid and, like this doesn't match it like <laughs> you know all that kind of stuff and they're like we're just trying to tell a story like don't get in the way of telling a good story oh um, wait I've, as, as a person who's seen a lot of uh, star trek yes you can <laughs> grow and if you like uh, star trek the next generation in fact um recently i went back and watched it and tried to watch the entire series from the beginning and that means sloshing through season one which has a couple of let's say interesting missteps on the way to wokeness as mm. if you might yeah, use that that good uh there is uh, I, i'm gonna bring up two episodes uh, in particular there's one where there's an entire planet full of african-americans uh who all fight to the death with sticks 
code of honor. Yeah, that's the one. No one liked working on that to uh, to their credit, um, mm -hmm. except the writer for some obvious for <laughs> some non obvious reason. I was going to say um, the other one was this uh, strange. Uh, hey, let's let's put the world on its head and have this deeply matriarchal society where all the women are tall Amazons and all the men are uh -huh. tiny little people. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what that one was called either. But uh, it was it's just it's a strange time in you know like the eighties where you get the sense of there's 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 a sensitive, uh, or there's a sensitivity that's wanting to get out, but somewhere along the way, it's getting drowned out by idiocy. Well, it's even in the original, paper. even in the even the, in the original series back in the '60s, it, it was like that. And I, I watched all of the Next Generation, and I watched all of the original series, and the latter is quite progressive for a 1960s show. I mean, Chekhov is Russian, and he's not an evil communist. And of course, there is that infamous uh, first kiss between an African-American woman and a Caucasian man on uh, on US television. I mean, so even you, going beyond... was Japanese directly after the Second World War. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, true, exactly. You still get some missteps, namely that Captain Kirk's role seems to be uh, screwing every single <laughs> woman he encounters on this show, and they all seem all too willing to let him have his way with them. Yeah, so I, that's why I, I think a lot of it starts with just sort of aware and critical media consumption. Like, you know, you, you have to sort of take things as they are of their time. Um, you know, you can enjoy reading, you know, Lovecraft, like, Thulem is mythos stuff, and then realize, oh, but actually Lovecraft was a huge, massive, honking racist. Yes. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to throw away, you know, the entire body of work, or we can't enjoy it or appreciate it, but you should, you know, A, notice those things, and B, sort of, like, critically separate them from the things that are admirable or interesting or worthwhile, and then C, when you go to make your own work, and, you know, Know, something like, oh, I want to make something that's just like 60s Star Trek and captures that like sci-fi adventure feel, or I want to make something that's Lovecraftian and is, you know, about the creeping horror of the vast unknown cosmos and stuff. Since you've recognized the problematic elements in the thing, then you don't just replicate them as part of the, you know, the whole like feel of this genre or work that you're emulating like you know uh, yeah. I'm not gonna throw green alien space babes all over my adventure you know 60s <laughs> sci-fi style thing just because that's part of the look I'm gonna maybe think critically about that right. maybe this right. time I can have you know the first officer the number one be a woman because I don't have you know the network screaming and flapping their arms over that decision or maybe the captain can even be a woman this time or maybe she can be you know, a woman of color or, you know, it's just you, you take the, the parts that you like and then consciously think about the parts that you're going to change and how you're going to build your representation. But, you know, well, hey, so here's the context here's, of, oh, 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 sorry, <laughs> shit. Uh, well, I, I, I did have a question regarding that, um, which was, was a kind of kind of a, a personal question for me, actually, because I have great difficulty separating the art from the artist and i was actually <laughs> hoping you would have some sort of advice on my end i'll give you an example i used to be as, as a kid i was oh not that one I've, i hated that band even before it turned out he was a pedophile um <laughs> <laughs> but um when i was a kid i was a big fan of earthworm jim uh the the cartoon series uh the games were much too hard but the the cartoon oh, series was fantastic and then it turns out that dr napple is a huge gun-toting right-wing uh racist uh, troll really he's just an mm. awful awful human being and well, we're not getting him on the show now uh well we could bait him with that he's, he seems to have a he seems to have a notification that goes off whenever someone breathes his name um <laughs> <laughs> but we we got we got in a in a Twitter tiff with Doctor Nabble at some point, didn't we, Fred? We did, I think we did actually, but I can't remember for the life of me what it was about. Him. I seem to recall that he followed at least one of us after that, and went, "Well, at least you guys are respectful, so there's that." 
I just called him something awful. Well, anyway, I, went and, I went and took a, a long shower afterwards. <laughs> my, 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 my question, I, I think you can you know, probably extrapolate from that, is is how how do I how do I get to you know respect and love Earthworm Jim even though its creator is a total d bag? Right. Um, I I was wondering if you were going to uh, go with Orson Scott Card, which is the one Ooh, that comes up a lot in the Scott Card. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, homophobic is actually oh, yes. I don't know uh, I know massive homophobe I don't maybe the racism it's hard to keep them all straight because that's the problem uh, especially <laughs> yeah, again these, it, these as you people go, are so hateful and it's just everyone blocking their path. Wait a minute, there was an interesting pun in there. It's hard to keep all those homophobes straight, isn't it? Mm. Hey. Sorry. I don't have it on my soundboard, but yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The CSI I thing. mean, it, the, and this is sort of like, you know, an eternal uh, ethical question. Like, I think um, one one thing to do when it's like, oh, do I go see, like, this new movie that just came out? Or, like, do I buy this book? Like... Maybe it's especially with, you know, living authors and creators who are objectionable. Like, you know, do I go and see the, like, Woody Allen movie? Like, all this stuff. Um, you know, maybe one, maybe try to avoid, you know, monetarily enriching the creator of these things if they're, you know, actively harming people. Or, you know, like, if they just have some, like, you know, grouchy, you know retrograde views but if they're actively like you know commit like contributing to campaigns or you know abusing people or you know taking actions in the world like you know definitely mm. try to avoid giving them your month they're giving them your money um, yeah. maybe go and like you know rent the movie from the library or something like if you if you want to consume the content but don't want to support the creator and don't you know walk around like you know displaying their logo and you know mm. talk about like oh yeah I'm gonna go you know see this movie. Well, um, well actually, actually, there's there's oh sorry, but th there's an interesting correlation there uh, to to video games, especially because Ducks and Apple also was crowdfunding the successor to the Neverhood, uh, mm. Armor Armor Croc, which. Mm. Which uh, first of all had nothing to do with his right wing views. He's very good at keeping those out of his, um, you know, his 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 art. Um, mm -hmm. And it looked fantastic. Really, I was never a big fan of the Neverhood, but you know, uh, it was during that Kickstarter bubble where we all wanted to support the indie devs, and uh, you know, and I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I was I was really conflicted on that level of, yes, this looks great. It deserves to be made, uh, and mm -hmm. the creator is a total d bag. Right. I mean, the if you think about the, you know, like, um, you know, Me Too stuff and like things about like the position, like these people who are in positions of power, but who have these like dominant or abusive, you know, personalities or, like keep people down and hurt people, but they like make all of this wonderful, excellent art. Well, mm. all the rest of the people that didn't get a chance, they can probably make some excellent art, too, if you know these these you know dominant abusive people didn't push them out of the way and like take everything for themselves so if we want great art we can try and you know get it from other sources like the world is full of art like all right maybe this is a wonderful game a wonderful idea like but somebody else could take that same money take those same resources and make something else you know equally good um without us having this kind of tortured conflict right. um, so <laughs> yes. i mean it's, it's sort of a thing where everyone kind of has to decide for themselves where their level of comfort is. I would say, you know, step one, like, don't support and enrich the person making it. Don't give them more opportunities. Try not to give them your money. Try not to give them publicity and support. But then there's the question of, like, should I consume? Should I admire? Should I appreciate this stuff? Um, and, you know, when, in, when we're talking about, like, Lovecraft or, you know, all of the you know, older works that, you know, some are products of their time. Sometimes the person is worse than their time. Uh, they kind of stick out as like a local maximum of awfulness or unwokeness or whatever. Um, you know, they're not going to care or get anything out of it, whether we read their work or not. But do we want to admire and engage with and, you know, sort of perpetuate their works, even mm. if, you know, the work itself, like, you know, doesn't, doesn't contain any of those messages or, you know, seems to be, you know, pretty wholesome and uplifting. Um, 
And yeah, and I that, definitely think you need to you need to keep a distinction, and you need to be historically informed. I mean, several of my favorite works of fiction, like Lovecraft and Bram Stoker's Dracula, and you know the adaptation of that uh, Nosferatu, all of those are kind of influenced by this unfortunate fear of everything alien to whatever nationality and political views that the uh, authors of these works had. And, you know, some of some of them were definitely worse than the rest of their contemporaries, but we, we should still, we shouldn't forget, we should be able to talk about it. We should be able to avoid, as you say, making those same mistakes. So in the context of, of gaming, um, do you have any recent examples of games that got it right or wrong, respectively? Um, I mean, I, I think it's easy to come up with uh, wrong examples um, in in games, especially the you know the further back you go. Um, I, I will say that, like you know, they don't get every they don't get every thing right and sometimes they make missteps but they're they're really engaging with it and making a great effort and that's bioware games yes. um they you know very consciously sort of in defiance of their fans of the people that you know are the ones giving them their money and screaming very loudly on you know the message boards and stuff and threatening their writers and being horrible people again it's a vocal minority um, but, you mm. know, they have chosen not to listen to that small, vocal, toxic minority and instead work on expanding their audience by very consciously making stories, characters, experiences that are very inclusive, that think about issues sensitively, that, you know, have a wider perspective. Um, so, I, and, you know, you can nitpick certain things like, oh, I didn't like the way that they treated, like, you know, trans characters there, or there weren't enough gay romances there, or, you know, whatever particular thing. But I think that they're, and they're very open-minded and, you know, open to that kind of criticism and very actively working to do good and be better. So I, I you know, always put them forward as a great example and why it's important not to let those, you know, trolls on your forum dictate like, oh, we can't put too many men kissing in this game or we'll make our core audience mad. It's like your core audience is a tiny core. There's a whole universe out there that's waiting for something for them to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, a game is never going to be able to cover every single facet of human life. I think that's... I, I think I think that's that's good that the the attempts are being made. I mean the the thing that often gets me with a lot of these sort of anti diversity arguments. I mean if you take a film like um, uh, Stand by Me, which is a predominantly white male cast, it's a story about growing up as a awkward boy in nineteen fifties Middle America. That's what the story mm -hmm. is, and it's a great story. It's very well told, and it's a it's a fantastic film. It's my wife's favourite film, so uh, I'm forced to watch it every now and again. You know, it is good, but that's fine as long as not every film is about white boys' experiences in Middle America, which unfortunately I think for too long has been the story that has been told. So, like you say, it's good that you know Bioware isn't going to get isn't going to do it by the numbers. They're not going to say, right, well, we need we need 50% female characters on the dot or we need, uh, you know, e X number of disabled characters because the la latest census told us that's how many disabled people there are in, uh, in America. But if it's at least trying to tell different stories and do different things, then I think that's... To me, that is objectively a good thing. But, of course, that's a, a political position in itself. I mean, there is a victory every day, isn't there? I'm mainly thinking about the world of movies because I'm a bit out of the loop in terms of contemporary gaming. But, I mean, the, the, the recent Star Wars movies are actually pretty good when it comes to representation. I mean, um, Finn and Poe are, uh, you know, you know you, you've got uh, an uh, African-British man as one of the leads and a Latino man as the other one. Um, and, and there are a couple of other minorities represented positively in those movies. Then you've got a movie like Black Panther, which I have not yet seen, but was wildly successful. And of course, once in a while, there's a step back. I was disappointed that when Marvel acquired the rights for Spider-Man, that they chose to go with Peter Parker again and didn't 
take the chance to do the story of Miles Morales, which is this other kid, this Latino kid who uh, grows up to be Spider-Man after Peter Parker. But, you know, mm-hmm. something is going on. I think it's 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 it's. It's not going to be a revolution. It's more going to be a reformation. It, it's kind of done in baby steps, but hopefully you get to enlighten some people along the way and you get some of these hateful dude bros to sit down and go, oh, this is this is not actually that bad. Yeah, and, you know, if, if they can't... Put it one way, there's still loads of media, you know, that's all the things that they're used to seeing for, you know, people that represent their demographics and, um, you know, but it's not like 100% or 99% anymore. So when you go from like 99.9% down to like, you know, 89.2%, like, you know, you still got most of it, but they notice that gap and they notice that difference and they're focusing on it and, you know, turning it into a culture war. But meanwhile, all the rest of the audience is kind of flowing into that, you know, growing space that does tell different kinds of stories and that does show different demographics and that, you know, just Mm. has a little bit more of an expanded perspective. And so you have to listen to all of the people who aren't your audience yet, but could be or might want to be. Um, I'm, I'm. Oh, sorry. You weren't. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I well, there, there's. It's been a full two minutes since I've said anything. So of course, <laughs> my ego cannot stand this. Um, I, I was. I was interested in what you said with uh, Bioware sort of dragging their uh, shitbird demographic, the minor subset of uh, shitbirds in, in their uh, demographic. Or demographic's the wrong word. Um, Audience was what I, what I meant. Uh, dragging them, kicking and screaming into a, 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 a you know a world of more tolerance and, and more respect, and I, I find that very interesting. And that's we're we're talking upper level triple A tier stuff here, where they have a massive massive audience. And so of course the uh, uh, you know the the shitbird delicacy of of that um, de- delicacy delegation. <laughs> Mm. Um, sh- why is the word play? shitbird coming up a lot? As if I missed something, uh, that's that's just my that's just my pet name for that very vocal minor, uh, <laughs> you know, minority of, in an they audience. They have a lot of 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 um. They have a lot of nicknames, don't they? <laughs> well, mine is. Uh, I, I I mean, I can't offend anyone other than people who enjoy poop and avian. I like uh, I I I like the uh, term shitlord. I think you like it. Anyway, the point I was trying to make was uh, we're talking uh, AAA games which have a very large audience, and of course there's going to be a, a sizable number in that shitbird minority. Um, when mm. you bring the scope down a bit to the indie scene and, of course, maybe shrugging here, maybe the adventure game um, sh- uh, subgenre, um, then we're starting to see a, a smaller audience, mm-hmm. but we're also seeing a lot more diversity. Now, I don't know if I... If, if, if it uh, bears sort of patting ourselves on the back to say, oh, well, we, 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 play, we play adventure games and therefore we are slightly more mature because it has a, a wide range of tolerance in it and, uh, you know, we're Shit using our thinking fuck. brains. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, it doesn't. But, I echo uh, Gareth's sentiment. <laughs> we're not more mature. <laughs> But is, is, there, is, is there some truth to my assumption that sort of the smaller or the more niche the market gets, the more likely you are to find less shitbirds in the demographic? Um, maybe overtly, but I think that's when you get more into the problem of the sort of like uncritical, like nostalgic hobbyist game developer slash, you know, geek consumer where you know that if you're talking about like indie devs and like small teams and especially these sort of nostalgia driven genres like adventure games and like rpgs and you know um you know these sort of like simple things that we can make with these you know great tools that we have now um then i think you do get a lot more of that um just uncritical making stuff that's like the stuff you like um, so that's why, um, you know, my, my talk was actually, um, 
you know, directed more towards that audience of the, mm. you know, I, I gave it at AdventureX, like the, you know, adventure game conference. Um, it is the small, you know, nostalgic hobbyist kind of developers um, that have this like really strong uh core community and love for a genre that's, you know, been kind of a niche thing. So, you know, you're kind of familiar with all the same works and you talk to each other and you have dialogue with like, you know, even like the creators who made all the stuff that you love. Maybe you got to like back their Kickstarter campaign or you got to like work on their revival project because oh, you're you, a developer. You, you, said, you, <laughs> you, you said nostalgia. Now Frederick is triggered. I'm dead certain. <laughs> yeah, trigger warning. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, that, that question of, like, you know, diversity and representation in games, there's sort of, like, two paths to it. One is to expand the creators. And, like, if you're at, you know, a Bioware or, you know, a Bethesda or whatever uh, big studio, that's just, you know, get writers, get creators in who have diverse backgrounds and have diverse perspectives. But when you're talking about very small teams or, like, solo creators, like, you are you, what kind of art are you going to make? Um, and there's, you know, kind of those two paths. One is the like, you know, write what you know, um, you know, which I would say write from your own personal experience more than write from the media that you know and have consumed. And then there's that question of like, but, you know, does your main character need to be the, you know, straight, white, cis, male, you know, able-bodied, <laughs> you know, slacker teen hero kid that is the hero of, like, every adventure game. Um, <laughs> maybe you can make a game, you know, with, like, a, you know, a black woman protagonist or, you know, a uh, wheelchair-using protagonist or, you know, make a character that's, like, a, you know, gay love story, even if you are straight, like, just to sort of, like, hey, let's have, you know, let's have yeah. some different representation here. But then you, uh, which I think is a great thing to do i encourage that as long as you do it and want not to just like tick the boxes or because it will keep sjw's on twitter from yelling at me um <laughs> you know if you actually like then embrace like yes this is the story that i'm writing this is the you know point of view that i'm presenting it is outside of my own experience so i'm going to educate myself and i'm going to be very open-minded and i'm going to do loads of research and I'm going to show it to people, you know, in that target group. If, you know, I'm not that and get their take on it, I'm going to like get that sensitivity read. I'm going to mm. listen to their feedback and I'm going to, you know, say like, does this represent you? Like, you know, do you see it? Is there any blind spot? You know, something that I yeah. missed. Like, and, yeah, because uh, I mean, uh, oh, sorry. I did it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I, I, I'm doing the like block you out, like, you know, ramble. <laughs> you know, breathe in the middle of a sentence so you can't jump in things, so... I do the same thing. It's, it's a brilliant tactic. I love it. No, 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 fin finish, curse you finish, both. Uh, finish, finish your thought, and I have a little follow-up uh, thing there. Um, I mean, yeah, that just, that's pretty much it. So my, my talk was aimed at that audience for how you can um, raise your awareness and create more diverse representations, even without being part of that group. Mm. Because I, I have to pat uh, our friend, uh, um, shit, I'm blanking on his name now because I'm so excited, um, James Dearden yeah. of, uh, of Techno, no, not you, mm. uh, <laughs> of, uh, of Techno Babylon, who uh, had a, a trans character in the main cast and had tried to write, you know, from, you know, from research and, uh, you know, his, his own, uh, you know, beliefs about how, how it is to be a trans woman, especially in the future and such. And uh, instead of just, you know, calling it a day and, and thinking, okay, I'll, I'll just shove this into the world and see what happens. Uh, he actually took the time to shop it around uh, several in the adventure game community who are trans, uh, the, uh, including our, our friend Serena Nelson, who gave him some pointers on some dialogue. There's there's one scene where, you know, one of the more old-fashioned characters uh, is quite astounded to learn this fact about a person who is uh, his partner and the i mean a scene like that has to be written very delicately and yes this time i do mean delicate um so uh, so, so yeah that's um uh, i just wanted to pat him on the back for actually taking the extra time and effort to say okay this is not within my realm this is when um you know we uh, you know I, I have to ask other people for direction and guidance here people who actually have experienced this yeah, that's that's an excellent 
positive example and that was a really great thing to see in that story and it was a really excellent character and you know really nice touch and just think like that it would have been diminished if he'd been like oh nope that's outside my lane i'm you know a straight guy like i'm not trans i'm not a woman like this is outside of my field so i i can't i can't do that and right. work you know, it's much richer experience because he didn't do that. He chose the, you know, maybe tougher but better route and yes. did it really well. Mm. Yeah. And, and, it, and it did turn out that he'd made some, let's say, he, he had one of the characters say things that uh, really wouldn't fly in any polite conversation. And he actually made the appropriate changes and the game was a lot better for it. And you got mm. the sense, you got the sense playing Techno Babylon that... You know, it's it's a reveal of sorts, but it's not a shocking reveal, and it's never really brought up again. It's it's integrated into the story as a natural thing. It doesn't it doesn't you know suddenly the character's entire life revolves around that fact. It it's a natural part of their personality instead of it being the whole thing. You were talking earlier about. Um, you know, it's it would be nice if we diversified, if we had uh, you know people of color as um, as our protagonists, if we have disabled people as our protagonists, um, the I, I suppose the minefield that we would have to watch out for is don't put them in gratuitously, don't make it seem like uh, we are doing this because we feel a strong need to you know be seen as this progressive person. Make it don't a don't be don't be positively racist and don't be ableist. <laughs> I'm guessing it's, it's something to take away from well, that. I mean, that's that's what happens when you bring in the black character. That's the the the, the, mm. the, 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 the only black character, character. Of that person is that they're black. That's when that yeah. becomes a problem. Yeah, it's always in horror films. It's always the first one to bite it. And you know, my <laughs> wife and I can like set our clocks at it. There are two things that always happen in horror films. One, inevitably, someone says, "I can't get a phone signal," and two, the black guy's going to eat it as well, one of the films, first. Horror films are a really good example, actually, because horror films are based on a load of tropes, and they're based on a sort of a, a culture of people sharing those tropes and replicating yes, regurgitating them, regurgitating them, regurgitating them. Yeah, but I mean, an often low budget as well, and the, the, the horror films are sort of mass mass produced to a certain extent. But in horror films as well, you also get those uh, directors and producers that do really interesting stuff as well. So yes. it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, Jess, about how having a sort of a, a, a sort of a niche market, it kind of gives the opportunity for more diversification, but it can also lead to the replication of the same issues that have come again and again and again. Get right. Out is a fantastic right. film. I kind of wanted to... to uh do a shout out to George A. Romero, even though Night of the Living Dead is by now an ancient movie, because what he did was he flipped that completely around on its head. Not only is the black guy the guy who makes it through the film the longest, but he gets uh, killed not by zombies, but by living rednecks, you know, at dawn the mm. next day. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite a, a thought-provoking way to end the movie. You know, what? Mm -hmm. who are the real monsters in this movie? <laughs> yeah, but to go back to something that uh, Troll said, you know, put, you know, you can put a character in that, you know, represents, represents a certain demographic or belongs to a certain group without making the character about that characteristic. You know, you can have a black person who isn't about their blackness or, you know, a gay character who isn't about being gay. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that, that even works, you know, better, especially if you're doing that writing outside your lane thing as, you know, secondary or background characters. Um, because, you know, obviously with the main character, you know, you get need to get pretty deep into that character and their arc and their psychology and stuff. But think about like the defaults that you use for like you know the nurse at the hospital or like the security guard that is always blocking your way. And by mm -hmm. the way, please don't dispatch security guards by like drugging them or like feeding them substances <laughs> without their knowledge. <laughs> like, that is so not cool. That is, you know, you're violating their bodily autonomy. Like you don't know their medical history. Like that is, let's remove that trope from the adventure <laughs> game uh, toolkit. Reminds um, me of that, that bit in Mystery of the Jewish that Richard Cobbett keeps bringing up where you poison a, a transient because you want to steal his coins to make a phone call and you're one of the scotland yard police it's like holy cripes on toast yeah. gabriel knight also has has a good one with uh, you know administering a, a sleeping pill to a beignet i think it doesn't go like that 
Yeah, just don't don't do that. Um, but yeah, my, my point is that like, you know, think about like just the defaults that you might go to for those stock characters. Like maybe we don't always need like, you know, a blonde female secretary at reception. And maybe we don't always need, you know, just a white guy is the, you know, cop sitting at the desk, um, you know especially with those secondary characters that, you know, you, they only have a few lines or they're just there for a little while, like, you know, um, <laughs> or even secondary characters like your, you know, your partner at the station or, you know, the sidekick character or whatever. Um, you know, maybe just try re-rolling their, you know, their characteristic generator and see, like, oh, maybe instead of, like, a white guy, oh, look, I got, like, you know, this is a Latino woman and, you know, Character stays the same, but I just like shifted the parameters. Like, I, one thing I like to, you know, try or suggest on projects that I work on is just look at some characters and just gender flip a few of them. You know, that mm -hmm. that receptionist, it's a guy. Like that cop, it's a woman. And mm -hmm. you know, don't change anything else. Don't now like, oh, it's a woman cop, so it's going to be completely different. It's like, no, it's just it's a woman. Or just keep the dialogue. Yeah. Oh, actually, do you have some concrete examples of games where you have, um, you know, made made a, a change or a, a difference in the storytelling, uh, where it's either a just a you know simple gender flip or a, a race flip or or whatever? And I'm now I'm making it sound like a fucking game of craps <laughs> well, or something. I've, I've actually um, I've actually got one, if if I may, and I believe you mentioned it uh, during your talk, Jess. You've you've mentioned Bioware during this talk. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. Mass Effect is a key example uh, because you can choose whether your Shepard, the main character, is male or female. Uh, but I believe the dialogue is pretty much the same across those two choices. Shepard is, in essence, the same character. It's just the the, the gender varies. Right, um, and yeah, that's that's a good that's a good sort of a uh, rule of thumb for um, uh, you know where you have a player generated character like. You know, I, I don't want, like, the world to treat me differently because I picked a female avatar instead of a male avatar, unless, like, for very good and very specific reasons. That's an important part of the story. But you would have to be very careful with that, I think. Um, but, I mean, as an example of that, um, you know, to plug a, a game that I worked on and that, you know, you may know uh, in Francisco's Lamplight City, um, the, your, like, main confidant, Confidant character, um, Connie Upton, you know, mm -hmm. works the police station and sort of like coordinates with you and, uh, you know, is basically your like return for help and advice and guides you, uh, character through the game. Originally a man, um, and I was like, why not make it a woman? Let's just have some more women in this game. She can be a woman who works the police station, and that just worked so much better. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just yeah, a really she's nice a cool change. Woman. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just like, you know, look for opportunities to do that, especially if you look and notice that like, you know, the, the true gender balance of the world is like 51, maybe it's even 52% female. So if you have like 20% female in your game, like maybe just make it look a little bit more like the world. Um, and again, not feeling like you, you know, have this checklist or something, but maybe you're just thinking of, you know, there's, there's that um, that famous statistic where if, I think it's over 30%, maybe, if a group is like 30% female, then um, then people perceive it as being overbalanced. They think the women outnumber the men, and they perceive <laughs> it being at parity around like 20% female or something. Wow. Um, oh, so, Jesus you know, Christ. Like, yeah. Be aware of that sort of thing. Like people would look at the you know composition of this podcast right now and be like, yeah, it's about balanced. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, like that's sure. That, that's and if that's there interesting. Were, like, two women and two men, then they would feel like, oh man, women are like totally dominating this podcast. Like you know, <laughs> what's with this affirmative action like podcast hosting crap? No, that's that's really interesting because when we were uh, booking guests for the season, we really made a conscious effort to get out of the sausage fest slump that we sometimes found ourselves in. And we really made an active effort to try and get some female voices in here because, one, it seems like they're really, uh, even though, you know, adventure game uh, fans being... Uh, 
<laughs> pat on the back, marginally less shit birdie than other uh, <laughs> game genres. But also, even though that's true, it's it's you know, they're they're not being heard enough. Is 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 my um, my well, understanding I mean, at least? I mean, I work in the tech business, and um, you know, I'm not sure. It, it, it probably applies across the Atlantic as as well. But here, a female computer scientist will, by default, be paid less than I am simply because I have this thing dangling between my legs. You know, and it's so fucking stupid. And part of our uh, reason for doing this podcast is that we want to illuminate and inspire people to design games. You know, we want to come in as these underqualified, undereducated idiots that we are and talk about how we perceive game design. You know, what difference does it make to us? And if we can inspire more women to pursue a career in tech by having women speak to women, I think we've done as good a job as we can. But the world's right. having more having women place. speak to everyone. <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 the other um, you know sort of uh, sort of view that comes in. Like, yeah, you know, if we need to engage women, then we have to get women to talk to them, and women will like help women and serve as their role models and stuff. But like, women should be a role models for men and for everyone. Um, and there's you know there's a thing I try to avoid of getting you know shunted into the like you know women's like special interest group you know, women in games and you know representation in games and you know all this stuff like it's it's just you know the other people who are already kind of like on that side that tune in and you really need to reach the broader audience and they're like oh it's women's stuff for women that's not for of me of course of course i'm just kind of of <laughs> this and you may you may disagree if if, if you uh if you uh well, you may vocally disagree if you uh, <laughs> feel like it, but 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 my point of view is that there there are biases to be broken, and again, I believe it's more of a reformation thing than than a revolution. You know, without knowing, I feel and fear that most of us kind of have these biases without even knowing, without wanting to cause malice. You know, oh, it's, it's kind of. Oh, I mean, the, 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 the people that the people that we've befriended, uh, sort of in person and over the internet, when we were teenagers, were people like us. And even even when you go to conventions, still you go to familiar faces or what what look like familiar faces, and you drum up conversations based on perceived shared experiences, and you build those kind of relationships. But it's important. hi, you're white. I like you automatically. <laughs> well, <laughs> to to be perfectly honest. <laughs> There's a lot of that that goes on. I mean, I work in I work in academia, and you still see it in academia. You see um, old white guys' books, and they're only citing other old white guys, and it's because right. they never just talk to other people as human beings. It's like, oh no, that that's the young woman over there, and it's just completely ignored. Mm. I think we I think it's it's an understandable thing to do when you're in an un incom uncomfortable environment and you're finding your way around but it's a completely indefensible thing to keep doing and just to yes. be able to to understand that you're doing that and i i think i i i think we've i mean i could be completely wrong here and you might shout at us and that i think that's fair enough and i'm, I'm certainly not looking for my cookie for being woke man but I think that we've, I think that we've made more friends from different countries and places that we would have never gone to and that we would have never found out about by deliberately making an attempt to expand those horizons. I yeah. just want to, say, I just want to say on the uh, you know, <laughs> good job, trolls, not letting Jess yeah, answer. Yeah. I was yeah, hoping she would shout at Gareth. Yeah, me too. I just wanted to get in edgewise that you are not on this show because you're a female. You're on this show because the topic is interesting. It's just that's it's not a ratio thing. Yes, I I, I didn't mean to accuse you guys of oh, doing no. that. If I did, yeah, you know, I apologize. I think, it's fair, but... I think it's fair to challenge the notions that we bring across. You know, that's what a discussion is about, and this is a discussion rather than an interview. So, Fred really you know, wants you to yell at Gareth, that's what he's yeah, saying. Yeah, I really want you to yell at Gareth. If you yell a bit at trolls, Gareth, fine. damn it. Good job. <laughs> yes, round of applause. Yeah, here's your cookie, Gary. 
<laughs> no, I mean, that's why it's really important to have, um, you know, people other than like, you know, the token women, people of color, diversity candidate people talking about this stuff. Like everybody mm -hmm. needs to talk about this stuff. And so, I'm, you know, I was really glad when you guys invited me on and you're interested in talking about this stuff. And, you know, this is what you're interested in. So, I, you know, that's we need more of that. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. That warms my heart. Uh, and it, no, it sounds sounds like a quip. It actually isn't uh, because it's a it's a topic that I've often wanted to talk about. However, I'm very is trepidatious a word because it is now. I just invented it um, <laughs> about about because it's such a minefield. And I'm a very it, it sounds it sounds ridiculous, but I'm very conflict shy. So whenever I get you know called out for having said something stupid or uh something that was offensive that i didn't immediately recognize as offensive i get you know i just crawl into myself and i can't bear to you know utter any sound for the next 30 hours or so mm -hmm. so i i try i i try and steer clear of those conversations but i'm i'm happy to engage in it now see now i'm climbing up on, because i feel like i'm on thin ice already but yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a really important uh, point, and it's a very common fear, and that's that was sort of one of the um, one of the attitudes that my talk was aimed at is that fear of like it's not my place to talk about this stuff. I don't know anything, you know. I'm not a you know a minority. It's anything. I'm the you know privileged whatever. Check off all these categories, and I'm gonna put my foot in it. So I'd better not weigh in, and I'd better step back, and I'd better steer well clear. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's the sort of things that you know leads to you just staying in your lane and making the safe stuff and you know not not extending your boundaries any. So then the work that we see is reflective of that. And then the only people that are drawn to it are the people who that work speaks to. And then that's the community, and it kind of like you know feeds mm. in on itself. So. Um, that's a, maybe maybe that needs to be a like more explicit part of this messaging in the future. I really am trying to reach out to people who feel that way and like want to do better and want to extend their boundaries, but are kind of afraid. And yeah. my point is that somebody is going to yell at you on the internet, no matter what you do. Um, <laughs> so you may as well get yelled at for you know trying to do the right thing and trying to do the unsafe thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe maybe they're not going to be that nice about it. Maybe it'll sting a little bit, but maybe there is something that, you know, you could have thought about differently or that's a mistake that you won't make again. So part of it is, you know, yeah, you have to like kind of develop a, a thick enough skin, but let the real criticism penetrate. And yeah, just, you know, it's like, uh, like the card said, if we're going to be damned, <laughs> Let's be damned for who we really are. Oh, like, that's no, a good and a, and, a quote. Per, and a personal appeal would be that if the politics rub you, the, if you're a developer or a, a budding developer uh, listening to this and the politics rub you the wrong way, then at least for the love of God, view it as an opportunity to tell interesting stories that haven't been told before. You know, there are pl you don't need to tell another adventure game story where the protagonist is a white heterosexual cis male. You know, they're out there in spades. Try and do something different, you know, stand out, make a story that stands out. If if you don't try to to uh, make a political message. Mm. And also the uh, the thing that we were talking about earlier with uh, trying to get more representation on this show, that stems back from what I keep seeing on, you know, places like uh, Twitter uh, is that us three being the you know the white males we can't we can't sort of legitimately sit here and talk about issues that are you know beyond our scope really we can we can certainly start the conversation but what we really need to do is bring people who have that experience into mm. you know exactly. our context more, and let, more let them talk conversations. about it. yeah exactly they're, they're more interesting conversations by having a plurality of voices yeah yes. and let them and let them talk without questioning or mansplaining everything they say basically <laughs> so if anyone out there wants to get in on the show and talk about their experiences we welcome it because fred is absolutely right not to get not to get on a high horse or anything fuck it we couldn't even get on a pony if we wanted to but <laughs> what we really what what we're here to do with all our you know porn samples and stupid humor and all of that shit what we are really here to do is learn 
And we, uh, that's why we invite smart people on the show, first of all, to educate us. And, well, that's really also the second issue. I couldn't, <laughs> it was so important that it had to be mentioned twice. Well, we're, we're, trying to, 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 we're trying to teach as well. We, we're, 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 try, we're trying to be educated and we are trying to educate. I mean, by no means do we get as technical as a show like Blue Cup Tools, but we're Which, more... The gender the... balance on that motherfucker is terrible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, Ben Chandler has very long hair. <laughs> <laughs> He does look a bit like a pony. No, I'm just... Um, no. <laughs> what? This is a, this is a complete silence after that. Come on. Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I got interrupted. And I'm, I'm just letting you take it from there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I did have one question. If we can... Uh, I know we're coming up on the end times and such. If we can... Yes, but I believe we can squeeze in one final question before the uh, apocalypse. Before the apocalypse. Before the apocalypse. Okay, cool. So the mushroom cloud is in the distance. Um, as a Space Quest fan, I sort of have to get this one in because it oh, was something. Dear. It was something that dawned on me as I was playing the uh, playing the entire series uh, for my for my YouTube channel, and something that had never really sort of it never really registered for me until I played it for, you know, an audience, air quotes, was that in Space Quest 4, there's uh, there's this transphobic joke that sort of comes out of left field, and I suddenly found myself trying to explain the whole uh, product of its time thing and being conflicted about how, on, on the one hand, it's not an excuse, on the other, it kind of is the excuse and i was uh, in the end it came off it came off as really stupid and uneducated and i probably made a bigger mess than i should have uh so uh, i guess the uh, question here is when you find yourself uh suddenly staring down at a thing that you used to admire and enjoy quite a lot and i still do incidentally uh, i don't hate space quest 4 for that one little slip of the tongue there um mm -hmm. but how how do you uh how do you go about explaining something from the past? Let's say let's let's not even say space quest. Let's just say the old you know sixty Star Trek and such, and mm -hmm. conv convincingly make the argument that yes, you can still enjoy it despite its obvious flaws with modern eyes. Yeah, I mean, I I think that that goes back to like we talked about just being able to examine it critically and like noticing is the first thing there's like the bottom level where it just you know it sails right through like oh space quest i love this stuff and like you know the transphobic joke slips through and you're like oh ha, ha, that's funny or eh, it's not that funny but whatever and then you just let it go by and don't even think about it so first step is noticing and thinking about it and you know when when you're like i said evaluating it for yourself like being able to separate that out and say like, yes, well, I know sort of like the creator's, the creator's perspective and this is sort of the point of view of the work and here are these things and like thinking has changed and that wouldn't fly nowadays. Mm. Um, and noticing the parts that you do enjoy, like, oh, the sense of humor is great. Or I really love like, you know, the freedom, like the puzzles, like whatever you do like about it. And then <laughs> when you talk, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when you talk about it critically, like not omitting to mention those things, not just saying like, oh, Space Quest, it's, you know, it's super great, so funny, so, you know, whatever, love it, you know, mm. 12 out of 10. Um, <laughs> but say those things, say like, yes, yeah, so now, you know, we, there's this one part that's uncomfortable, it's a transphobic joke, like blah, 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 and like there's some, I mean, there, I, I will admit that, um, you know, I, I played the Space Quest series recently, and it's it's not my cup of tea. I think that, you know, that's sort of uh, the creator's perspective and, like, that worldview that kind of infuses it, I find, off-putting. Um, you what? know, very, like... <laughs> <laughs> We may have um, failed to mention that all three <laughs> hosts of the show are massive Space Quest fans. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, well, but that's, that's sort of one of those things where, you know, you just think about, like, how it embodies the creator's point of mm. view. Like, very male gazy, very tropey. Yes, like, exactly. the humor is this very sort of sophomoric thing. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I gotta give up. <laughs> to, add a, to add a bit of, of personal perspective to it, just to even it out a bit, I, I do recall one 
uh, personal incident actually where I made an off-color joke about women on Twitter and Scott Murphy who wrote Space Quest 4 actually leapt at me and berated me for doing that and said mm -hmm. that was not cool that was not funny you know stand with women instead of pulling that bullshit and I got something out of that interaction so uh, while noting all of this stuff about products of their time art versus artist, yada, yada, yada. It's also important to note that artists grow. And, you know, yeah. Scott Murphy of 1993 may not be Scott Murphy of 2000, whenever that was. Yeah, that's a really excellent, excellent point. Um, yeah, which just, you know, goes to show, like, people, people evolve and their tastes change over time. If you, you know, idolize this one great master work that was, you know, made at this certain time, and, like, that's your jam, that's your nostalgia, like, maybe the creator looks back on that with, like, embarrassment, like, oh, God, like, I totally wasn't thinking about this, or, like, that was a mistake, or, you know, I've matured so much in my work, like, what about this new stuff now? Um, but you're kind of like, you know, frozen in amber about that one precise moment, like identify what it is about that moment that you love and look for that in other things. But don't just be like, no, it has to be this entire thing just like this, just as it is. It's perfect. You know, no imperfections, like can't critique it. If you attack it, you're attacking me and my heart. It's like, no, I'm not attacking you and your heart. I'm attacking this one problematic thing that you should be able to look at objectively without it, you know, collapsing your whole house of cards of identity and, you know, love and fandom that you've built up around this thing. Right. Yeah, my, my friend, my friend uh, Brian Demodulated says that growing hurts, but it's supposed to. <laughs> right. That's a good way to put it. So, and it doesn't uh, have to I... hurt that bad. <laughs> no, exactly. It's just a tiny sting and you'll be good. So the shockwave is approaching and people are heading for the shelters, but uh, I've understood that you have one final thing that you want to uh, get into this conversation, Garrett. Well, yeah, I mean, the the first bit was um, a, an artist that doesn't grow over time and gets stuck in that kind of period is called Ricky Gervais. Um, and the, <laughs> the second... Um, Second point really was um, something that you mentioned about the female character in Lamplight City and that the, you might, I, I think there's too many people who try to use, um, oh, it was a product of its time as a get out. And one of the things that we've seen on uh, British television, and it's been a roaring success around the world, uh, is Downton Abbey, where um, mm -hmm. basically by, by doing a period drama, um, fellows had the opportunity to write the middle class upper middle class porn that he wanted to with mostly white faces <laughs> and a an idealized and version fights. of britain that never ever existed um mm. so so i mean for lamplight city for example i mean it would have been i think it would have been quite easy for uh, a less uh, savvy writer to go oh well it's you know it's set in the 1800s or early 1900s women didn't work then so no women in the game that will be fine which is completely ahistorical from uh, you know, for for one thing, but also uh, just a cop out, um, and I, I think it's important that we don't use product of its time as a way of being able to give ourselves a pass in the present to not think about these things, and even worse, as a weapon to just go back to what we think this idealized world that never existed was. Right, um, and another another strategy is that you know maybe. Uh, there are periods, well, one, if you're doing something that's like fantasy or set in your own universe, like Lamplight City is one, you can feel totally free to break the rules. Mm. Two, the vision we have of the past is often highly filtered. You might think that, you know, it was it was only, you know, young men going off and adventuring and conquering and building things and working and doing stuff, but, you know... They still had women, and women even did some of the adventuring and conquering and building stuff and doing things, but their stories haven't passed down to us. Yeah. So, one, look for the stories of those people uh, doing what you think is atypical roles. And two, look into what the typical roles of, um, you know, look at what the oppressed groups or, you know, minorities or women or, you know... Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, like, the a, a great blog is um, Medieval POC, 
and it sort of looks at like art history representations of of you know people from the Arab world and from Africa and you know black people in in you know medieval Europe that it's like no look they were they were around like they were represented they were there <laughs> mm. but you know maybe they had experiences of you know not being the you know the figures that have come down to us from history is you know the kings and popes and emperors but what were they up to like they still existed then and they probably dealt with a whole lot more strife and struggle and adversity and challenging circumstances like tell those stories oh there, there's an interesting star trek the next generation just to bring this thing full circle there uh, an interesting star trek the next Gen <laughs> yes there's there's one called Lower Decks, which you know, you've had the entire series of just the bridge crew, uh, you know, going off on adventures and hearts of starboard and uh, fire facers and whatnot. Maybe some diplomacy in there as well. And then there's one episode that's all about the people working, you know, at the shuttle bay or you know, in, engineering crews and you know the adventures going on around them. But it just tells the story like very confined to their role. Just what the what the hell is the ship doing now? Are we under attack? And then they just run off for cover and such thought that was a brilliant episode can't recall any of them being you know specifically minorities or anything but just just the idea of remembering to have you know the perspective of not just the class or you know the the, the demographic of the main character in there try and get as much of the of the world your, your field is world building and i assume that means you know have a look at the entire world and not just the protagonist and his immediate his I said his um, immediate circle of friends just you know get a slice of the entire world in there somehow. right and that to uh, to bring it back to something else we mentioned the new Star Wars that's one of like I've I've never been a huge fan of Star Wars because it is very much this like you know it's about your like pure and noble birth and it's about these elites these princesses and these knights yeah. and these you know <laughs> people with these bloodlines and special powers and that's always been kind of off-putting while just like the waves of anonymous faceless rebel soldiers die it's like oh i'm hit ah it's like oh we hardly knew ye rebel <laughs> soldier number 568 um and yeah. but the the new one uh, the new movies really do tell the story of, you know, the little people, you know, just the common yes. folk and their struggles and what they're doing. And, you know, their heroism is probably 10 times greater than the heroism of the heroes who are like, you know, sort of born to rule and have it all. Um, so those, those are the kinds of stories that I think we could do more of. And yeah, that, that shows us more than just the tippy top <laughs> strata of this whole entire world. Full of interesting people. It, so it reminds that's... me. <laughs> reminds me of that one good joke in an otherwise kind of awful movie, Austin Powers, where it's <laughs> uh, some henchman gets shot, and instead of just falling to the floor, and that's the end of it. Camera pans away. It goes um, back oh, to you know his, his wife and kids. They come home and they find this letter, and they just oh no, Henry died. Oh no, he was about to be named henchman of the year, and, and it's, everyone breaks down crying. And it's like a lifetime <laughs> movie. Yeah, and and someone specifically goes, no one ever thinks about the family of a henchman or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that seems uh, like uh, as good a place as any to wrap this up. Jess, thank you so much for your time, and thanks for an interesting and very illuminating uh, conversation. Where can people find you on the internet if they want to get woke? Sure. So um, I'm I'm on Twitter at at Jess underscore Haskins. It's J E S S underscore H A S K I N S. I don't tweet nearly as much as I should, but occasionally there's a retweet of something about world building or a picture of one of my cats. Or a um, podcast. <laughs> or a podcast. Um, you can find me on the web. Um, my, my independent consulting, writing, world building, designing, editing, bunch of stuff company is Paperback Studio. I'm at paperback-studio.com. You can see there games that I've worked on, Lamplight City and other adventure games and fun stuff that's coming up. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. One of those two things. Poke me in one of those places and, you know, let's talk about worlds and games and stuff. And Star Trek. And Star Trek. I'm always up for that.
<laughs> and if you want to keep listening to the uh, kind of trying sausage fest, but still not quite there, that is Backseat Designers, you can find us at backseatdesigners.com. That's where you'll find all the links to subscribe to the show. We're also uh, on Twitter at BS Designers, uh, which we usually use to yell at each other and people that we know and love. <laughs> so that's the platform for that. We have an open Facebook group called Backseat Designers. So try to type that into Facebook search field. And not only will you find our group, but Mark Zuckerberg will know where you live. Um, since <laughs> Trolls mentioned this show is about us trying to uh, be educated, uh, I should say that this is quite an arduous task. For that, we may require some funding, um, which you can provide <laughs> nice. at patreon.com slash backseat designers. We used to uh, pour the money away on cocaine. Now we mainly use it to go to AdventureX and all these wonderful conferences where you can hear people uh, like Jess talking. So um, there is that. I believe that. Patreon.com. Yeah, patreon.com slash backseat designers. I believe that is all of it uh, for from us this week. So say goodbye, trolls. Bonsoir. Madame, say goodbye, Gareth. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me as well. And we will see you next week for our season finale. Yay! No more for today. Mm -hmm.